Hey, we're starting our series today on uh, Apostle to the Church, and today it's Apostle, Apostle? That's because I was going to say Galatia, and, and my little linguistic problems kick in, so I use the, sh, the sh on the first word rather. Anyway, Apostle to Galatia. And uh, so I, I, think, I think we've got, if I've done the right thing, which is unlikely, then Mark will have a little image up there for us. Have we got that? Yes. Fantastic. And because uh, what I wanted to, to give us, what we're going to do over the next few weeks is talk about um, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, four of those short letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to particular churches or areas to address particular issues in the life of the church. And we want to look at each of those, give us a bit of a church history lesson, but also give us a bit of an idea of what was going on in the churches and what we need to take on board as really the essence of the Christian faith. Because remember that what, they, what Paul was doing was the, the church was very new and he was, he was correcting stuff as they went along to get the culture of the kingdom of God right. That's what was happening in, in each of these letters. And this, this letter to the Galatia area is the first of those letters. And what you can see here, over here is modern day, uh, well, what was ancient Syria and uh, Jerusalem and so on is down here somewhere. And this is where they started from, was Antioch. One of the first really big churches was, uh, or church groupings was in Antioch. This is where uh, Barnabas went. This is where Saul went there to get going in terms, this is where Barnabas and Saul were sent out, kind of the same way that we've sent out Matt and Nana and Andrew and Maya. Um, in the same way, Barnabas and Saul were sent out from this church to go and actually plant the gospel. Now, what I, uh, for those who are interested in such things, it did occur to me, um, they, this is the way they went, and they went by a Cyprus and then up into here and, and around and back, and this is the area of Galatia up here, which we're going to get to in a minute, and who he's writing the letter to. Now, this is around about 47, 48 AD, um, 20 or 18, 19, 20 years after Jesus um, is when these guys were doing this. I did wonder, why did they go to Cyprus first? I mean, there is a trade route and all that sort of stuff. But I did find out, I didn't know this before, but Barnabas came, I think, from Salamis, but he came from Cyprus. So what was happening was the first place they went to was actually Barnabas' hometown. And so they, when they wanted to do a mission trip, uh, Barnabas said, well, we're going back to where I come from so we can preach the gospel to the mob that are there. So that's what they did. And they went there and they went around there and up around there. And these places, Lystra and Derby, Iconium and so on, these were the places where they planted churches in around about 47, 48 AD. And so they planted these churches and then they went back to Antioch and from there or thereabouts is where Paul's going to write this letter. Because what's happened in the meantime is once they've gone around there and they've come back, a whole bunch of Jewish believers who think that everybody had to be Jews as well as Christians, so all these Gentile believers that they'd reached out to there, these Jewish guys, they followed the same thing and they started telling the churches, look, Paul's just come with the God, well, Barnabas and Paul have just come with the gospel, but you need to know that you've got to add on the Jewish customs to the message of Jesus. It's not enough to believe in Jesus. You've now got to become Jews, do all the circumcision, the laws, the sacrament, do the whole thing if you want to be a proper follower of God. So that's what had happened in the meantime. And then Paul hears about this, and then he's got to write a letter back to this area, these churches in Galatia, and say, what's going on, guys? This is a mess. And so he's sorting out that problem. Now, just so you know, it's about 600 k's from Antioch around to Derby. And uh, so that would take at least a month um, walking or on a donkey or whatever. So we've got this time lag of messages going backwards and forwards. As people are moving around, there's some heresy starting to move around. And then Paul gets aware of it and then he writes back to them. And So when you're reading the letters and Paul and he says, I want to come and visit you, that kind of thing, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about these places he's gone and planted the churches and they're having dramas and he wants to go back and help them work it all out. So that's the context that we're in, okay? And that's Galatia up there, which is part of modern-day Turkey. Now, just as a point of interest, 
while you grab your Bible and turn to Galatians. Uh, just as a point of interest, we currently, ACC in Australia, have a young couple working in Turkey doing church planting. Isn't that fascinating how these things go in seasons and cycles? And so what Barnabas and Saul were doing 2,000 years ago, we currently have people re-establishing the church uh, in modern-day Turkey because, of course, they'd gone away with the Ottoman Empire and Islam and so on, and now there are people back there replanting the church in this same area. And that task continues for every generation. Amen? Amen. How exciting was that? Don't you love church history? It's fantastic. (laughs) Anyway, it's interesting to me to get the picture of what they were doing. Grab your Bible, have a look at Galatians. We're not going to do, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, You could have done that before we got here today. Uh, Read Ephesians this week if you want to keep up with what Henke is going to be sharing next week. And, uh, and away we'll go from there. But Galatians, three basic sections of Galatians, first couple of chapters, Paul's giving the essence of what he's on about. He defends his own. Every time you, anytime you hear Paul defend his own ministry, understand that he's actually defending the gospel message. So in those first two chapters, he defends the gospel message and he talks about his own ministry because it's important that they understand that they heard the gospel from Paul and it's the true and right gospel. That's why he defends himself. It's not just to get a big head or anything like that. And then three and four, there's some more applications. And then five and six, he wraps it up again. So we're not going to go through all of it, but we are going to get a focus around what he's talking about. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, this is the essence of what he's saying. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel, we being Paul and Barnabas, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching you to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. That's the core of what he's saying to them. And then if you come to chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, in the meantime, he talks about himself and his ministry, but then he wants to give them a strong example. And in verse 19, he says, through the law... I died to the law so that I might live to God. Now, you remember that Paul was a Jew, not only a Jew, he was a Pharisee, so he was a stickler for the law, and he's saying to them, because they knew him, he's saying to them, you know that I was keeping the law, you know that I was a Pharisee, you know where I came from, and then he says to them, I, am, I have died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. So he's saying, no longer am I keeping the law to satisfy God. I'm not trying to do that anymore. No longer is it I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul saying to them, If anyone wants to live in the law, that's what I was doing. I was trying to do everything right. I was trying to get all my works lined up and make sure that I could please God. But he says, I've died to all of that because that's not going to get you there. And now the life I live, I live because Christ lives within me. A life of faith. It is so easy to fall back into a life of works and law. And everybody does it everybody, because it's built into us that somehow we're going to make it happen. I've been reading in uh, 1 Samuel, and there's some great stories in the Old Testament, and 1 Samuel has some rippers, and what I noticed reading the first few chapters, there's some crazy vows in the Bible. People make these vows to God, you know, typical Hollywood thing, if you save me, God, then I'll do X, Y, Z for you. All right, so there's these crazy vows that all come from this idea of law and works. The worst one is one of the judges who has a problem and he says, I'm going to sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house when I go home. What a stupid thing to say. Now, I think I might have, in my household, that's a pretty safe bet. 
because I know what's going to be the first thing to come out of my household. But we won't go there. But, but he didn't. And so what happens is his daughter comes out and he sacrifices her to God because of this stupid vow of works and law. Works and law lead to death. That's all there is when you go with works and law. But in Samuel, and Samuel does the same thing. Saul does the same thing. He makes a vow. They're fighting the Philistines and Jonathan, his son, has made a great victory and has led the people in great honour. And he makes this stupid vow and says, if anybody eats anything today, they'll be accursed, which means they'll get killed. And and, and then what happens is the people are hungry, the, fight, the fighting people are, they go all day chasing the Philistines who've been oppressing them and invading them. They go all day and they're wrecked and Jonathan doesn't hear the vow, so he takes some honey, they're out in the bush and they find all this honey, he takes some honey and he gets invigorated, but everyone else is wrecked and as a result, they don't chase down the Philistines and the Philistines remain a problem for generations to come because of a stupid vow works of the law. But in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and this is the bit I want us to just look at quickly, 1 Samuel chapter 1, we see the mother of Samuel, Hannah, and she makes a vow, but it's a vow of faith. In 1, uh, 1 Samuel 1 verse 11, it says, this is what she's praying for a child because she hasn't been able to have kids and she's getting older and big deal in those days. And she vowed a vow and said, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Now you could look at that and go, well, that's, that's the same thing. You know, it's a, a, a works, a vow. No, it's not. That is actually prompted by the Spirit as a vow of faith. She's heard something from God, there's a prompting of the Spirit, and she's made this declaration within the plan of God. And then what we see at the end of that, around about 19 or thereabouts, uh, verse 17, Eli, the priest, he answers and he says to her, "'Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you've made.'" So there, she's made a prayer and a petition and the priest says to her, go in peace and may God grant your petition. Now, as a result of that statement, she hears with faith. That will become important. She hears with faith. In verse 18, she says, let your servant find favour in your eyes. Then the woman went away and ate and her face was no longer sad. She actually received the word as a promise and from that moment acted in faith that her life was going to change. And it did. And she had a son. She gave that son to the Lord to serve God. And then she had multiple sons and daughters afterwards, having been barren right up to that point. As this woman walked in faith with God in an era of law and works where other people were making all kinds of crazy dedications to God. That's what Paul's talking about. This is the history of the Jewish people that Paul is actually talking about. He's saying, if you get wrapped up in works and law, you will have death. But if you'll open your heart to hear with faith, then you'll have life. So you may ask, what does that mean for us today? I'm glad you asked that. So come with me to Galatians chapter 3, and we'll see the application that Paul gives to them. Galatians 3 uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Verses 1 to 14 is the section that we're going on. Um, oh, come on, I'll read it. Here we go. Oh, foolish Galatians. It's good that when the Bible calls someone an idiot. I just like, I enjoy that. Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that you, I would just love for Hanky next week to get up and say, foolish city life people. I just hope that that's what he does next week. I would enjoy that. Um, for, where am I? Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was... By the way, Henke's away this morning. Uh, you know the combined churches stuff that's all around the country and so on? They've got a special meeting today. So he's meeting with the guys from uh, Toowoomba, Queen, Brisbane, Newcastle, etc., etc., etc. So that's what Henke's doing today, which is uh, very good as far as I'm concerned. Let me ask you only this. So here's Paul. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish 
having begun by the Spirit, you are now being perfected in the flesh. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? They suffered by Jewish persecution for believing in Jesus. And he said, are you going to give that up now? You suffered for the message of Jesus, but now you're going to give it up and just align yourself with the Jews? Why are you doing this? This is not good. He says, verse 5, he says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. You see the point he's making? It's not just the Jews who are sons of Abraham, but it's people who live by faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you all the nations will be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. And so on he goes on the same basic theme. You cannot be justified before God by the works of the law, your own efforts, but only by faith. And so he makes two emphases there that we're going to look at today. And the first one is in verse 3 and 4. He says to them, basically, are you going to be perfected by the works of the law? Is it a rhetorical question? Probably. He says, are you going to, are you going to make other works? So he's saying, having come to Jesus and believed in him, are you now going to be made perfect by doing a whole bunch of works? And of course, the answer is, no, that's not how you're going to be perfected. Now, this is the temptation that every believer pretty much falls into. And we all go, I'm going to come to Christ. I can't please God on myself. Jesus has died for me. He rose again. I need his life in my heart so that I can come before God. And so salvation we receive by faith in Jesus. And then we often lock back into an old style of religion of works. And we say, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I've got to do the other in order that I might please God. That's what was happening in this group. And I'm sure we've all done it. I'm sure we've all had that thought of I'm not good enough. I'm doing, I've got to now change my behavior because I'm not good enough and I'm going to have to pull myself up by my bootstraps and do better in my life and I've got to put more effort into this and all of that. Now, there is a subtle deception that goes with all of that. This is why when we do our offerings, we talk about if you're obligated, if you feel obligated, if you've got problems, then don't do it because that's not of faith. But if you've heard a word of faith, then you engage. There's the subtle difference. Both are going to give. One's giving out of works and obligation and the other one is giving out of faith and hearing by faith. And there's the difference. And Paul's saying to them, you are not going to be perfected by your works. In fact, you'll be perfected by hearing from the Spirit and living by the Spirit. That's how you'll be perfected. And in, ver- in chapter 5, verse 16, just over the page, have a look. Chapter 5, verse 16, he literally just says this to them straight out. He says, I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's pretty simple, isn't it? If you genuinely followed what the Holy Spirit was saying, including the Word of God, what the Holy Spirit has spoken already, if you were living by that, then you're not going to satisfy the flesh because you're following the Spirit, the Word of faith that comes to you to live by faith. He says, you're not going to get the desire. He says, verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Understand one thing. If you get into a works-based religion, you will fail. Everybody who tries to live by a works-based religion fails 
even to do what they believe in. The Jews all failed, the, the uh, Muslims fail, the Buddhists fail, the religious old-style Christians fail. People say, how come we have the Crusades where the so-called Christians invaded the, the Muslims and fought against them and thought killing Muslims was the way to please God? Why? Because they were not led by the Spirit, but they hooked back into a religion of works. And a Christian religion of works is no better than any other religion on the face of the planet. They are exactly the same. It is only a religion of faith and love for God that allows us to live for God. That's what he's saying to these guys here. He says, if you're led by the Spirit, verse 18, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. He says, the works of the flesh are evident, and he goes through what they are. And then he comes down and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. And some people even make a list of the fruit of the Spirit. And they go, now I've got to do these things. I've got to, I've got to you know, make the effort and be loving and kind and patient. And all. Now you do have to make the effort to be loving and kind and patient. But if you're going to do it, it's got to come from hearing from the Spirit, hearing with faith from the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit speaks to you and you hear it with faith, then you'll be able to do it. You'll be able to live it. But while ever you're just externally imposing that from some teaching or some whatever, then you won't get there and you'll fail every time. We all do. Hearing with faith, following the leading of the Spirit. Amen? Oh, I want to share with you. We had, I was out with Hamilton on uh, Friday night at the uh, Fresh Start van. And uh, the reason that they do that and we engage with that is to engage with people who are really struggling. And uh, I sat down, we set everything up. I did the barbecue, champion me, and uh, <laughs> burnt all the sausages. Anyway, not to worry. And, um, and I sat down with a group of guys have, and, and ate with them. That's the practice that I do each week because, you know, you got to connect with people, eh? So I'm sat down with these guys, and uh, one of the guys starts it, which is fascinating. If you, if you position yourself to engage with people, God will start working. And it doesn't happen all the time, but every now and then God does something. And this one guy says to me, he says, are you religious? And I, I always react a bit to that, because I feel like saying, no, I'm not religious. But I didn't, I wasn't the smarty pants guy. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, and he said, what sort? I said, oh, basic Christian. And he, said, and he says, so am I, I'm born again. And I'm thinking, well, hey. Uh, and the other guy that was sitting with us, I thought he was just going to freak out. But he actually said, he said, what's that? Which was really interesting. Oh, hello, God's at work here. Something's going on. He said, what's that? And this guy gives him the religious answer. Well, you've got to love Jesus and you've got to blah, blah. You know, he's a bit off his head, this fellow. But anyway, that's all right. And, uh, and so anyway, we got, so as this guy's asking, I, you know, the, the discovery stuff we do, this is why it's so important just to be familiar with those stories. Because I just said to the guy, I said, oh, it comes from a story of Jesus meeting a religious guy. And then we talked about it with non-biblical terms. Jesus met this religious guy and the religious guy didn't understand what it meant to be alive to God and to have a relationship with God. And I, we talked about becoming spiritually alive. And left, I just left it. We talked about that and left it there. Then I found out one of the other guys, our, our team, one of the other team, two weeks before, had prayed for this same guy to have his shoulder healed and God had touched him. So God's working on this fella. But what I notice when, I'm, when you're sharing the, the gospel like that, there's got to be a hearing with faith. Now, as I'm talking to the guy, I'm realizing he wasn't there yet. So I wasn't going to push him for a prayer or a decision or anything like that. But God's working on this guy's heart and life to bring him to a place of genuine salvation where he hears with faith. That's how we're meant to live. This is what Paul's talking about. He says to them, when you got saved, you heard with faith and you received the message of Jesus. I'm asking you now to live in that faith. So our salvation and perfection comes from listening to the Spirit with faith. But it goes on more than that. And Paul talks to them about other stuff. That thing's turned off on me. Uh, talks to them about other stuff that happens when we live with faith. And if you come back to chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, he uses the example of Abraham. 
because the Jews always wanted to say, I'm a son of Abraham, blah, 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 because that was their forefather. And in uh, chapter 2, verse uh, 5, he says this to them, when I find it. Chapter 3, verse 5, that looks better to me. Uh, Okay, look at this, verse 5, chapter 3, Galatians. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Not only are we saved and perfected by hearing with faith from the Spirit, but we also engage the purpose of God and the blessing of God by hearing with faith. Now come to Hebrews 11, and I'm going to finish basically with this little bit. In Hebrews 11, it speaks about the heroes of faith of the Old Testament, and it speaks about Abraham, which is why Paul's talking about Abraham at this point. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, it says this, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Holy Spirit had spoken to him and he went out in faith to go where God had told him to go. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has a foundation whose designer and builder is God. He was trusting God for the future. By faith, Sarah, Abraham's wife, herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, 99 or whatever she was. Uh, (laughs) It's a great, woo. Uh, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These guys heard in faith and stepped out trusting God. I wanna, I've got a question for you. Were Abraham and Sarah, were they perfect people? Did they believe perfectly in the promise of God? No, they did not. Abraham, at Sarah's instigation, takes on with the, with the help and off we go with Ishmael and all the rest of it as a result of them trying to what? Fulfill the work of God by a work of the flesh. That's what we do all the time. We get a promise and we think, oh, God's going to do something, so now I better make it happen. So Abraham and Sarah, oh, we better make it happen. Hebrews 11 doesn't tell us anything about that, does it? Anyway, we'll leave that for another day. But they, they, and Sarah, when she first hears that she's going to have a baby at 90 or 95, whatever she was, 90, I think, when she heard it, what does the Bible say? She laughed. She's out behind the tent laughing. And then they say she laughed. And she oh, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. So they're not perfect at all. Like, they're not perfect at all. But what does the Bible say about them? It says they were able to live by faith. Even though they made all these mistakes, they heard with faith and they followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, they fulfilled the plan of God. The promised land, the promised child, the coming Messiah, all of that because Abraham and Sarah heard with faith from the Spirit of God. What's Paul saying to the church in Galatia, those towns? What's he saying to us? I think he's saying a very simple message. The righteous live by faith. Live by faith. What are you hearing from God? That's why what Liz shared today is so important, not not just the content of that, but the practice of that, to read the Scriptures and hear from God. That's, what, that's how you're going to be perfected. That's how you're going to be changed because you're going to read the Word which is breathed by the Spirit of God. He's going to speak to you and in doing so, He's going to bring faith for you to change, for your brain to change, your thinking to change, your behaviour to change. Not a religion of works but a hearing by faith to follow the leading of the Spirit of God. The reading of the word is so important because otherwise you'll think you're hearing 
by faith, but you might be hearing some weird and wacky thing. The best one I've ever heard was a guy that was going to divorce his wife and take up with his mistress. And he said to me, that's biblical uh, because it's a different rib. He had this idea that Abraham, you know, he had the, you know, Eve was made out of the rib. And he said, I've, he's, being, he's following the leading of God because I had the wrong rib. And now I've got the right rib. And I didn't say it. But you know what I was thinking. You foolish Galatian! <laughs> Who has deceived you? But that's, the tr- that's real. That's a real story. That's a real person really being stupid. That's why we need to read the scriptures. We need to be in fellowship with each other. And we're testing what we hear from God, which is the whole point of 1 Corinthians 14, order in the church. If there's prophets, let them be tested and checked. Ah, oh, come on. Humble, humble curiosity before God, humble obedience to the Spirit, educated by the Word of God and our brothers and sisters, and then we're hearing with faith and living that kind of life. What's God speaking to you about? What's he talking to you about your family? What's he talking to you about your, your, your situation in life? What's God speaking about? I'll just finish with one example. Years ago, because I've worked for the church, basically churches, nearly all my life. I did a few years in industrial relations and a few years in training. But apart from that, I worked for churches. And as Adrian has shared so eloquent with us, is you don't get rich working for churches. That's the truth of the matter for most people. There's a few rich pastors in mega churches who do crazy stuff, but most of the people don't get rich. So God spoke to me a while ago, long, how long, 15 years, I don't know how long ago. I got to a point where I thought, we've got to buy a house. And I thought, there's no way we're buying a house. It's just not going to happen, you know. So I just listened to the Spirit. It wasn't as simple as all that, but basically, fundamentally, that's what it was. I had an impetus inside me from God saying, you need to do this. And so then we looked at every cheap, dodgy house that we could find that would vaguely be within the realm of possibility, and then God began to work. And through some bits and pieces I won't tell you about, he, he made it possible for us to buy this dodgy little brick cottage that we still live in, and I made it into a four-bedroom house, holy dooly. And one of the kids, no, it was the three, yeah, no, it was four. Uh, one of the kids was living in a sunroom with a sort of enclosed thing. One of the kids ended up living in the old garage that we finally, after 10 years, stopped leaking water. But uh, it was a complete disaster when my oldest son was living there. He enjoyed it greatly. And uh, so it's not, you know, it wasn't a McMansion, you know, out on a block somewhere at West Dapto or somewhere. I don't, like it was, and that's great. If God leads you to all of that, fine. All I'm saying to you, there is a difference between getting into some mega mortgage and messing your life up and, and, you know, not being able to serve God because you're so constrained and constricted. There's a difference between that and hearing by faith and following step by step whether it be about possessions or family or your work life, anywhere. There's this huge difference between trying to do the works yourself or hearing by faith and following the leading of the Holy Spirit. And if you will do that, that's why Jesus said, if you will seek first the kingdom of God, then the rest will be added to you because you will be following the leading of the Spirit, sorting your own life out, making provision, engaging his purpose, all by hearing by faith. Amen? Let's stand together as we pray today. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for these churches. I thank you for these churches in Galatia that were some of the first churches that had heard the gospel and gave themselves to follow Jesus. And I thank you for the Apostle Paul, who you called to speak to them and keep them right on the right path. What an amazing thing. So, Father, we thank you for what we have in your word, the reality of those churches and those people and their experiences. And we want to open our hearts to learn from that. We don't want to repeat the problems and mistakes of history, but we want to engage what you've called us to. So, Lord, I ask for everybody here today, every one of us, me and Liz included, that we all, Father, that we would hear from your Spirit that as we hear from your Spirit, the faith would rise up in our hearts so that we would engage what you have for us, that we would stop living in the flesh 
and gratifying all the desires of that, that we would live in the Spirit and trust you to bless and provide and engage your purpose. I ask it for every one of us, Lord. Help us to discern what is our own voice, what's the voice of the world, and what is the voice of your Spirit. And get it right and let that faith build in our hearts and our lives to live by faith in our workplaces and our family. Lord, that we would see your blessing flow not just the blessing of the earth, but the blessing of the Spirit of God. We ask it today in Jesus' name. Amen.